Hello everyone, I know it's been a long time since I've had a video, so I'm going to do one now, and it will be on the basics of assembly language. Now, there won't be any code on this tutorial for numerous reasons I'll get onto in a minute, but first of all I'll explain what assembler is. So, assembler is basically the lowest level of programming that you can feasibly do today. So, you can do lower, but it's not very practical. And in a lot of cases, assembly itself isn't practical because it can be done better by C, it can be done better by Java, done better by Python. But in a lot of cases, assembly is still quite useful. So, assembly is the base level of code for a machine. It still has to be processed by something called an assembler, but it's basically almost as low as you can go where the actual opcodes that are on your processor are made into these reasonably human understandable mnemonics which means it's quite it's quite quick to learn but it's very very hard to program it's like it's almost like chess in a way except a very very hard version of test of chess so you can learn it reasonably easily but writing anything with it's a pain unless you've got you either understand it really well or or you don't really need to do much with it so yeah there's going to be no code in this because of varying architectures with them they aren't all one language per se so like the processor on my machine is an x86 64i3 which runs different to the ARM chip in my phone which runs different to the 6502 in my toaster or something these all run different assembler languages which require all different opcodes and various other things. So we're just going to go through the basics of it today. I know I haven't written anything yet but I'm going to write something in a minute on here. So yeah. The basics of assembly language are quite varied. I think I'll probably just cram this into two videos because I've only just thought of these in like three or four minutes. So we have registers. And what registers are are little blocks of you could call them memory but they aren't really on your actual CPU that you buy so say you go out and buy an i5 that'll have the registers built in and same with any other processor you'll buy even the really old ones from the late 70s that are in the Atari 2600 even they have registers so say in ARM we have say R0, R1 and R2 these are ways of accessing these registers in assembly. Now, these obviously vary by platform as I've said. So, we'll have R0, R1 and R2 for ARM, but with something like x86, we have different ones, and there's also pro there's also registers that serve different jobs. So, there'll be some for indexing, memory and things, which I'll get onto in a minute. And there'll be some which we call general purpose, which will be like these ones mentioned up here. I'm not so sure about ARM, but I know that x86 definitely those are those are definitely general purpose. So you can store you can store numbers in these. You can store characters in these because don't forget characters are numbers because they're based off ASCII or Unicode or perhaps even UTF, which I think is actually Unicode. ANSI, that's what I mean. So, yeah, they're basically incredibly fast variables. Which there's the reason they're so fast is because if you imagine the circuitry in a machine, so you've got a like a circuit. Imagine an electrical circuit running on direct currency, uh, currency, current. So you know, you probably know that electricity doesn't go at the speed of light. So if that's if that's news to you. Well, now you know. So, the memory, if you've ever looked at a motherboard, which I imagine a lot of you have, you'll notice that the memory is a good six or seven inches away from the CPU in a lot of cases. Which, considering these are actually inside of the CPU, probably a matter of millimeters apart from where the arithmetic logic unit lies, it's far faster to access the registers, so that may therefore means it results in a faster, a faster program then we have memory now memory is a, like imagine a bees nest so you've got various cells in a bees nest or a wasps nest it can be anything with cells heck it could be a prison you know so imagine a bees nest and we have every single individual different 
larvae in one of these cells. Now, a lot of these are different. A lot of these are bred for, say, dr being drones. Some are males. Some are females. You know? So, they all hold different things. And that's memory. I just knocked that when I was flicking my hair across my head. Um, so, there are two main memory models that are used on a lot of machines. So, we have something called Von Neumann. Which I'll go over, mostly, because... This is what runs on just about every machine nowadays. There are some microcontrollers that are exceptions to the rule. And how it works is that you have... And so you have one bank of memory here called code. That should be an G. Terrible laptop keyboards. And then we have data segs which are technically the same memory which are the same memory hence technically so they're all stored inside of the machine it's like regular RAM so how it works is that on in in your regular operating system that you're running now probably Linux, Mac OS X or Windows the operating system ho handles a lot of where these are for various programs but we'll discuss it at a low level say MS-DOS sort of level so how it works is like the program will do it itself in MS DOS. So the program will define where its code segment starts, it will define where its data segment starts if it's less than 64k. So we'll have how it works on Von Neumann is that the code is separated from the data segment, which makes it a lot less confusing for the machine. So if you miscode something, it won't accidentally execute your data instead of the code. Whereas the other kind is called Harvard, Harvard architecture. Just to mention, if you're interested in the history of these, they were discussed generally in the 40s and 50s during the Second World War with things like Olympus and things and cracking the Enigma code and things. So how Harvard works is you've got one big bank. Yep, eight, nine. So how it works is it's big, one big bank, but the data and the code are pretty much stored at will which is good for low level microcontrollers as I've mentioned because it means that you can pretty much put what you want where you please but when it gets into big machines like this where they can afford to do Von Neumann it can sort of be a bit confusing for a program because obviously it might accidentally execute the data instead of the code now that's basically how they work though there are, there are things like virtual memory which I'm to be honest not very sure on because I don't program operating systems, although I've tried. So, this is how, so basically, well now I'm going to explain how programs are executed. So how they're executed is that there's a special register up here called a program counter. Not really used to this laptop keyboard, I've been working on desktops recently programming so how programming counters work is it's a it's if you imagine a for loop in C you've got a control variable there and it increments however much each time it goes through now it works like that except it works for every individual instruction so if you imagine your program starts starts here on code seg 0 now when it's ran that code it will go up one or it will go up dependent on the instruction because there are some instructions that can cause this program counter to jump to another piece of code, run that. It's sort of like loops. That's how loops work at a basic level. So that's how programs are essentially executed. Then, at least on the x86 platform, we have various kinds of code that you can choose from. You can choose from either GAS or Intel generally. Now, GAS is like a new assembler, so. Now, you may think, oh, it's GNU, I'm going to use it. But I'm not sure that's a good idea for you, because it's very, very confusing in comparison to Intel. Now, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean either that Intel controls the, the assembler itself, because they're actually open source assemblers for both. So, obviously, GAS is GNU assembler, which is open source. But it looks very confusing, so... I don't actually program it that much. I've programmed it once, but I went straight back to Intel, because I preferred it. Though I don't want to cause a holy war by accident. It looks generally like this. 
So there are these dollars next to it which generally point out what data type it is exactly whereas in Intel it's not necessary. So that works in the basic in this sort of mov instruction it's different for others but so we have our source here which is the source of the information and then the destination is here so this mov instruction which tells it to move a piece of data to a given place moves the data stored in address 12 to address 36 now so I'm not familiar with gas so it might be incorrect syntax but well that's the general idea whereas we have intel down here which is a lot cleaner and there's like there's various ones for that but I use NASM because it's really small. It can be like apt get apt get it did on on Linux very easily, and I've just used that since the start. So it works a bit differently. So we have say so what this does is that it swaps them around and it removes these in all the cases. Though you have to use it in some cases. So we have the number 16 here and how this works is that this is the source as opposed to that and that is the destination rather than that so 16 is now moved into our AX register and that's basically the difference you can try either if you've got like build essential on Linux you already have GNU assembler but I recommend getting NASM anyway because it's about a megabyte at the most and it's basically one I've used so I can recommend that there's also other ones called FASM which I used a bit but I haven't really gone back to not really sure why but I've just used NASM from from the beginning really with the exception of some FASM so this can be quite impractical well it's quite impractical to use ASM sometimes so I'm not going to write much for this because I can just explain it in my speech. So say you're trying to build a game. You want to build a game. Say you want to build something like Mario but on your x86-64 right here. Now we have enough machine power nowadays to not have to worry about it because we've got we're running billions of instructions a second. We've got billions of bytes of RAM. Now we don't have to do that. We can just use C. We can use C++. We can use Java and we can use Python for that and it will not make much of a difference to user experience unless of course it's very complex however there's also a way of employing it so in C++ there is something called inline assembly which uses gas here because you're generally using GNU compilers and what it does is it marks out a part of the code which is already assembler and doesn't compile it and it just runs in a machine like that which is quite useful in a lot of cases like I know for a fact that John Carmack used it a lot for programming quakes physics and things so yeah and it's also impractical for other things say you're trying to write a business ap application or a spreadsheet program or something for one of these no point but if you're going to be programming on DOS heaven forbid or if you're going to be programming on a Commodore 64 or a ZX Spectrum or something you're going to want to use that unless somehow you want to program something basic enough to be run on basic so it's quite impractical for a lot of cases but if you want to program if you want to just put it in like if you want to put it in line if you want to say write an operating system I want, I've wanted to write an operating system for a while and I've written some bootloaders I think I'm even holding the floppy disk that has my bootloader on it right now um, so that's that's basically the main language you're going to want to use for it because it's really fast, it can do a lot of things that C, C++ can't do, so it can access interrupt script tables, it can access IRQs, there's there's various other things as well it can do that others can't, so it's practical for that, but it's not practical for most people, probably 99% of programmers, though you'll probably have programmed it at some point, like, they, I know for a fact they do it at university and college, as you call it in America. So some book recommendations that I'd like to talk about there's one particular one there's 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 something called Doodleman on the internet which contains a book called PC Assembly which is about a thousand pow a thousand pages long and it includes a small library that you can use with assembly and it teaches you it teaches you the basics of assembly it goes through a lot of the stuff that I've stated in this video in a lot more detail and it's a proper book you can buy it printed but it's free as a PDF and I suggest you read it there's also a book called what was it called? I just had it in my mind. That's it. The Art of Assembly Language, which has three different editions. The first two are for a Microsoft DOS, which is basically 
good for, if you want to program if you want to program operating systems look at dots programming frankly because it's slower level there's a lot less to do with the architecture like with, there's a lot less to do like you're only running you're only running millions of instructions this time around and you've got only millions of bytes you know compared to the billions we have here and in some cases nowadays trillions I'm talking high level servers here though and those are basically the book recommendations for assembly books but there's also one more I'd like to mention especially if you're interested in operating system development there's also there's osdev.net which is a very good or osdev.org even which is a good site with lots and lots of resources it contains a lot of links to websites with loads of information that you otherwise probably wouldn't find and there's a lot of book recommendations on there probably about three or four dozen if I recall and all these books are worth having frankly because there's like everything from algorithms to how operating systems work at the base I got I got a copy of um, Andrew S. Tannenbaum's operating system specifics on my table right here it's um what's it called design implementation that's it so that's basically what I t wanted to go through here and I'm back I'll be doing more videos and I'll probably be doing an assembly tutorial in the next couple of weeks depending if I get if I have to do something that that will interrupt this because a lot's been going on so thank you for watching and I'll see you later